Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Jonathan Smith. I work at the University of Reading, but only for the next hour. Um, so this is the very last day before I retire. I have no idea what I'm going to do after I retire. Um, and I have no idea why I agreed to give a talk to Barleep um, on my last day. But um, I've given this talk before here at Reading, so um, I, I, I think it should go OK. So I'm going to talk about um, academic integrity and student use of uh, online tools. And this is something that uh, I was kind of interested in um, back in 2019. Um, and I attended a Bali PIM at Goldsmiths, uh, in which there are a couple of presentations about student use of machine translation. Um, and we kind of got in, interested in it here at Reading. We had a little special interest group around uh, machine translation. And then COVID happened and uh, it just kind of fell off the agenda. There were other priorities. Uh, and I've, I've recently kind of, kind of uh, renewed my interest in it. Um, partly because I was supervising a master's degree student um, who, who was looking at the use of machine translation. So the main focus of um, the talk is going to be around this assertion here that technology is providing support to language users in ways that was unimaginable 10 years ago. And that's um, support that no longer has to be mediated by humans. So artificial intelligence and natural language processing um, developments have, have meant that uh, you can now get feedback from the machine rather than the person and that this feedback can be, be pretty helpful. So I'm going to talk about this claim here and then I'm going to um, discuss the implication for the um, higher education sector and for EA, specifically for EAP. Uh, what I'm saying is not particularly new. Um, people like Mike Groves and Klaus Munt uh, and Walter Nolan at Nottingham Trent and Jake Groves and Rena de Vries at uh, Birmingham have, have uh, talked about this, as I said, back way back in uh, 2019. But I, but I have the sense that it's been a, um, something that a lot of people have kind of been aware of, but have, have not really confronted. And I think it's something that we do have to kind of confront and come to terms with. So I'm going to talk about four different uses of technology in academic communication. So machine translation, there's um, already been a lot of discussion, quite a lot of research around the use of machine translation. I'm then going to talk about automated language checking, checking of grammar, spelling and punctuation, for example, using tools like Grammarly. Uh, and then machine paraphrasing, um, which uh, I only became aware of when a student told me that she was using it and I had a look at it and it looked really quite interesting. And then finally, I'm going to talk about automated captioning, the, the implications of, of student use of automated captioning. So that last one's a bit kind of a, a bit of a kind of add on. Um, and it's, it's not terribly well thought out, I have to say. But I think it's I think it's something that we need to, to be thinking about. So I'm going to start off by talking about machine translation. I'd, I'm going to try and talk for about 30 to 35 minutes. So hopefully there'll be plenty of time for um, questions and discussions if, 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 if we're allocating a full hour to this uh, session. And I, I, I will certainly stay on for the full hour and perhaps even five or 10 minutes after that. So I'm um, gonna start off with machine translation. The questions gonna ask are, are students using machine translation to support their studies? If so, how are they using it? And what can machine translation do for them and what can't it do? So I'm gonna start off by 
um, referring to a survey conducted by Walter Nolan in 2019, and I attended um, his presentation um, on the use of machine translation by students at his university back in 2019 at uh, that was a, a Bali PIM in at Goldsmiths. So he did a survey of 91 uh, international students, and some of these were pre-sessional students or students on a similar program. Some of them were students on degree programs who had already done, who'd completed a um, pre-sessional program, and then were on their degree program. And then some were uh, direct entry students. So they went straight into their degree program. They didn't have to do pre-sessional. And um, so one of the questions he asked was how, how often students were using machine translation. And um, these are the results that he presented. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I've got the um, reference twice there, one in the middle of the, um, of the, uh, the chart. Um, so he asked students how often they were using machine translation. The column on the left are the pre-sessional students. The, that's the green column. The blue column are the students who um, have uh, done a pre-sessional course or similar uh, and are now on their degree program. And uh, the column in yellow are direct entry students. So about 80% uh, reported using machine translation and about 60% said they use it sometimes, quite often or most of the time. And about 30% said they used it quite often or most of the time. So that's, that's quite a significant percentage, I think. Um, you can see that there's less use by direct entry students. Um, and you, this is to be expected because on average, um, direct, entry, direct entry students have a higher level of English than students who've done pre-sessional program. So the, the next question that he asked was, sorry, uh, I was just going to say that um, this, I looked at another bit of research carried out by Jake Groves and Rena Fockel de Vries. Um, and they did a, a very similar study and their, their um, findings were pretty much in line with um, Walter Nolan's findings. So about 80% of students saying they were using machine translation and about 30% of them saying they were using it often. Um, Walter talked a little bit about how they're using machine translation. So, the, you know, the, the, the question is, are students using it for um, reading or for writing? When I first became aware of it, uh, I was teaching on a pre-sessional programme and I kind of became aware of students using it for, for, for producing essays for their writing. But then uh, I talked to colleagues who are working on in-sessional programmes and they were telling me anecdotally that, that students who are on a, an ESAP course, uh, these were students in accounting and finance and who had to read a, you know, a, a kind of set text on, on um, finance, a, a really thick tome. When they were um, reading from that text uh, in, in sessional classes, they were actually just taking their phone out and, and sort of scanning the text with their phone. So they were reading the whole thing in English. And, uh, and, and I was told that they were all doing that. Uh, it, the person who told me that was, had, a, had a class which I think were almost entirely Chinese students. So, um, so, it's, so it's clear that students are using machine translation for both writing and reading. So here, reading, uh, most students say they are using machine translation mainly for translating words or phrases. Um, 
But notice here, if you if if you look the um, pie chart on the left, are those students who are on on a, on a pre-sessional course, EAP course. When they get onto their degree program, and that's a pie chart on the right, you'll see that there is a green segment suddenly appearing, and that's the whole text. So you can see that when students get onto their degree program, where the reading load is probably significantly heavier than on their pre-sessional program, then they use machine translation for more of the text, large parts of the text, or, the, or even the whole text itself. So some students are very, very reliant on machine translation to read texts. When it comes to writing, results are broadly similar, except that students claim not to be using machine translation for large parts of the text or whole text. So, uh, so they say they're not writing assignments in their L1 and then using machine translation to translate them. You know, they're not writing the whole assignment in their L1 and that's, that's encouraging. One comment that I would make at this stage is that the it, that uh, in 2016, Google Translate moved to a, a, a kind of different um, system for machine translation based on neural network technology. And that new technology uh, made it possible to relate translations of phrases to other phrases or clauses in the sentence. So you can see here that, you know, a lot of students for writing saying they're putting in you know, words or phrases, and, they, and far fewer of, of them are actually putting in sentences, but actually they might do better if they put a whole sentence into Google Translate and got it translated, even if they're focusing on just one uh, phrase in that sentence, because the, um, the algorithms that Google um, uses make mean that uh, you, you, you're more likely to get a, a, a more accurate translation if you put in a sentence rather than the phrase from within that sentence. Okay, so uh, as I said, Google moved to a different technology in 2016 and they claim that this has improved the accuracy of its translation software by up to 60%, And it, but that depends on the the language pair that you look at. So um, the accuracy of translation varies depending on whether it's English, French, or English, Chinese, or whatever. Um, Groves and Munt say that um, um, machine translation has not replaced the human translator. Um, you still need to kind of edit your trans your your translation. You still need to edit your uh, your text after you've you've run it through the tran the uh, translation software. Um, and commercial translators these days start with machine translation and then they edit it afterwards. And certainly, if we want students uh, to use machine translation effectively then they need to verify the accuracy of those translations. So one thing you can do is you can take the, the English phrase that you've come up with and you can put it into Google and you can look at, it, look at that phrase in lots of different contexts. Um, Groves and Munt make a distinction between absolute and relative quality in machine translation. And what they mean is that if international students already have relatively strong language skills, if they're at IELTS 7 or higher, then machine translation is unlikely to help them. But it will help students at lower levels produce more grammatically accurate and lexically accurate writing than if they had not used it. So machine translation can't add features of academic writing that, that are not already there in the L1 text. It doesn't have any reader awareness, as Groves and Munt put it. Um, so if, for example, 
a writer is making bold claims when presenting hypotheses or the results of their research uh, in their L1 text, machine translation will not add the hedging. But if there is hedging there in the L1 text, then it's likely that machine translation will translate it accurately and appropriately. So I haven't really talked about machine translation and academic integrity. Obviously, if you just find some L1 content, machine translate it and pre present it as your own and hoping perhaps that Turnitin will not pick this up, uh, that is likely to be judged academic misconduct. And opinion has been divided about whether machine translation of your own writing is acceptable or whether it's viewed as poor academic practice or academic uh, misconduct. And that's whether you're doing it with the, with the whole text or just part of the text. Groves and Munt argue persuasively that since machine translation doesn't change the content and it, it can't improve the content, and that since translation is used extensively by academics anyway to read texts in other languages, um, the use of machine translation on your own writing should not be regarded as an offence. So that's, um, that's machine translation, and we can come back and talk about that later on. I'm gonna move on and talk a little bit about um, language checking tools, and I'm gonna look at Grammarly, because I think you know, a lot of people have heard of Grammarly and may actually uh, have used it. Uh, I'm going to show you Grammarly in a moment, but um, tools like Grammarly typically check for grammar, punctuation and spelling errors, and they claim that they're also able to check for clarity and appropriate style. Um, I have um, reservations about that latter claim. I, I don't think that what Grammarly says about clarity and style is particularly helpful. Um, I think Grammarly tends to flag up minor non-impeding errors. So things like, you know, use of determiners, subject, verb, agreement. It certainly misses errors and it flags up as errors language that's acceptable. We'll look at that in a moment. It produces a large amount of feedback, but this isn't very clearly focused on useful corrections, corrections that would make a significant improvement in the quality of the writing. So I'm going to um, look at Grammarly with you and I'll just kind of talk through it with you. So this is, um, this is actually an authentic student text that I put in. Um, it's produced by a student at, I would think, IELTS 4.5, five fairly low level students, fairly typical of the students that we get on pre-sessional programs during the academic year. And all the um, bits of text that Grammarly has commented on are um, underlined in, in red there. So the first one here, we, you've got the education is becoming more different than the past. Well, this is quite a useful correction because, um, so Gramley has identified that, you know, education here should be, you know, it's a generalization, therefore you don't need an art article. So, you know, you could, you could write education is very different to how it used to be 20 years ago. So that's a useful correction there. The next one here, We've, we've missed out in, yeah, that's a useful correction too. Uh, more different than in the past, yes. We need the preposition there, useful um, correction. But then there are corrections which are not quite so useful. If I go down to, um, well, if I go to the next one here, Therefore, less number of school or university. So again, they've, they've put schools as a the plural form for generalization, universities. Yeah, that's good. But then if we come down to learn by traditional method, what they're suggesting is that the correction should be the traditional method rather than 
traditional methods. And that's, and that's definitely, I think, a miscorrection there. So Grammarly does pick up things. It does make um, useful corrections, but it also miscorrects uh, things and it misses things. So here you've got therefore less number of school or university. It didn't pick up, pick up on that. Um, I one of the problems I have with grammar, Grammarly is that it, it, it produces an, a lot of feedback. So on this text here, there are 121 possible corrections, 121 comments for the, the student to kind of plow through. You can kind of change the settings a little bit so you can edit out some of the more frustrating comments. Uh, you, you can ask Grammarly not to check for specific features, but it still produces quite a lot. Uh, I put into Grammarly a text that I wrote myself. Um, on authoring tools. And it suggested 100. It, it, this is a text of, I think, about um, a page and a half. And it came up with 110 suggestions. So I think, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I'd hope that none of them were actually sort of grammatical errors and they're, they're mainly sort of stylistic things. Um, what have we got here? Yeah. Uh, Grammarly doesn't like the passive, really doesn't, um, which is, you know, odd in uh, academic writing. So, so, some of some of the things that Grammarly sort of flags up are, are a bit odd and it, it doesn't really kind of explain why things are wrong things you know you've got to kind of work out what what the problem is yourself. Grammarly I think works quite well if you were using it with a teacher and um, there are a couple of studies by academics in Australia who who used Grammarly um, as part of an in-sessional program, and, that, and, they, and they reported quite positive results. So that's Grammarly. Going back to the presentation now. So students um, in general find Grammarly useful. Um, I personally have I, I, I have reservations about how, how useful it is um, for students. I think students could spend an awful lot of time using Grammarly for very kind of meager benefits. Um, and as I said before, um, it has been used on EAP support programs, on in-sessional programs. So I think if the teacher helps students to use Grammarly critically, then, then it's much more, it'll be much more effective than if the student is uh, using it without any kind of support at all. I'm going to move on and talk about um, paraphrasing tools. And the, the paraphrasing tool that I, I'm going to look at Quillbot, I found quite interesting. Um, when we teach students um, practical paraphrasing techniques, we often say things like you can use synonyms, you can change grammatical structures, you can change from active to passive and vice versa. You can change, say, from an idea that's expressed using a verb to a nominalization, and you can change the orders in which, in which ideas are presented. In my experience with the kind of students I teach, and you know, these are students who might start at 4.5, 5.5 and get up to about 6 or 6.5, most of those students really don't move much beyond using synonyms. And they find it very difficult to apply. You can practice these different techniques in isolation, but when it comes to them applying those techniques um, in their writing and applying the techniques in an integrated fashion, then they find that really difficult. But some paraphrasing tools, online paraphrasing tools, will apply all of those techniques in an integrated fashion. 
The other thing that I have to say is that turn it in flags up as matches um, stretches of text in which words have simply been replaced by synonyms. So typically with, with um, turn it in, you've, you've got it set up so that if there are um, say five consecutive words, which are a, a, an exact match with something in the repository or on the web, it will flag it up. But if you take out one of those words and you replace it with a synonym, it will still flag it up as a match. And um, you probably noticed that for yourselves. Uh, are these being regarded as plagiarism? Well, I think there's probably a temptation to regard that kind of patchworking um, as, as plagiarism. So I'm going to show you a, a, a screenshot of a to, tool called Quillbot. <coughs> so Quillbot is, I am losing my voice. I will just take a swig of water. Excuse me a moment. So um, Quillbot, like most tools, there's a free version and then there's a paid for version. <coughs> this is the free version that I've used here. And you've got the source text on the left and the, the paraphrase on the right. So you just paste in the source text and, uh, um, and then click on a button and it will produce the paraphrase. The boxes I've added myself just to make it uh, a bit clearer for you. So the boxes don't appear in, in, in Quillbot. But if we look at some of these things, um, so the first thing we've got is um, the traditional norms of intertextuality in the original text. In the paraphrase, we've got established intertextuality rules. Well, <coughs> so you've got you know, norms of intertextual of intertextuality, you've got a sort of the something of something, and that's been paraphrased as a compound noun. So you, you, you're, you're already changing the order of words. You've got um, intertextuality rules. Rules are not quite the same as norms. So that is a bit of a, in my view, this isn't a, you know, that's a, a weakness of this particular paraphrase. Um, then if you look at the, the red box, um, you've got just one change here, a synonym, advancements instead of developments, it's fine, no problem at all. And then you've got a change from passive to active, but at the same time, you've got not only that change from passive to active, but you've got a different verb. So you've got are ch challenged by in green in the source text and contradict in the um, in the paraphrase. So they so they're using two techniques there. Um, and then if you look at the blue box here in the original text, again you've got a. Um, Yeah, you've got a passive structure, something that needs needs to be learned. And then in the uh, paraphrase, students will need to learn it. So that's quite nice. And I think one of the good things about this is that you've got a var variety of techniques used. You've got the synonyms, you've got different structures um, used, and, 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 and the information is presented in a different order but you're keeping the meaning the same or pretty close to the original text. It's not a perfect paraphrase because there's still too much of this paraphrase, which is too close to the original text, the source text. But I think it's pretty helpful to the student. So the question is, are students using paraphrasing tools to beat Turnitin, are they to plagiarize? So are they taking ideas written in English from, from other sources and just trying to put them through paraphrase, uh, a paraphrasing tool and then present them as their own ideas? Or are they using them to produce paraphrases of correctly cited ideas from other sources? And if, they're, if it's the latter, 
is that okay? Well, I think there are problems with uncritical use of paraphrasing tools, meaning may be misrepresented. So that example of norms and rules, that's a slight misrepresentation there. Uh, there are opportunities for language development, I think, um, in using paraphrasing tools. Um, I think one key problem is that I think one of the reasons why we ask students to paraphrase is, we, we, is that it kind of demonstrates that they've understood the source text. And if they're using an automated paraphrasing tool, it no longer demonstrates that they do understand the, the source text. And I think if they use these tools, it's less likely that the paraphrase is really kind of integrated within their own writing, which is something that you, you want them to do. But certainly, I mean, I think Quillbot does have potential um, as, as a tool for language development. I think it's potentially a useful tool for helping students understand the mechanics of paraphrasing. Um, there's been little research into paraphrasing. Um, some research focusing, focuses on testing the software to aid detection. So there are a couple of studies from uh, academics in Australia. Um, uh, both of these pairs of academics, I think they were in the same institution, but and they were um, um, subject tutors uh, in health sciences. And um, one of the things, so, so that they didn't want students to use paraphrasing tools and they wanted to give uh, academics advice about how to detect its use. And one of the things that they pointed out that is that if you look for paraphrases of standard discipline specific technology that often re reveals that a paraphrasing tool has been used. So, for example, in their field, the, the term emergency department in a, in a, in a hospital is not, is not a term that's normally paraphrased, but in student paraphrases, it was coming up, up as crisis center. Well, a crisis center, whatever it is, is not an emergency department in a hospital. Um, the term insulin shock, which I think is um, a, a reaction that diabetics have to high levels of glucose. And I think I, I, it's related to the, the production of insulin in the, in the body. So insu in, insulin shock is related to uh, diabetes, and that was being paraphrased as insulin surprise. So surprise there was clearly wrong in the context. And then CAT scan was being paraphrased as feline output. So these were quite amusing instances of where clearly the, um, the use of the power of uncritical use of the paraphrasing tool results in, you know, nonsense. Other research that I've looked at uh, focuses on their potential to assist students in producing paraphrases, but there's been little or no discussion of academic integrity or of their potential use for language development. So these two approaches represent different ends of the spectrum from a focus on, on gatekeeping to a focus on dis responding to the students' immediate needs. Um, and none of the studies that I've seen explore how we can help students to use these tools critically and at the same time meet academic standards. OK, uh, I, it's, it's about 20 to 5 and I'm, I've proceeded a little bit more slowly than I thought I would. I'm going to move very quickly through the, the, the remaining slides so that we do get a chance for um, some discussion. Um, uh, here at Reading, we've been using Teams for um, live lessons. And with Teams, students can switch on the live captioning. And we're, we're aware that they're doing that. The live captioning is very accurate. Um, 
many universities have kind of automated learning capture. So if you have a lecture, it's automatically recorded and it has ca and, it, and uh, captions are produced automatically. They can be edited before making the, the recordings available to students. Um, and in fact, if you, if you make corrections to um, words or phrases that are typically miscaptioned, then the software learns to recognize those words or phrases and correctly caption them. So that the more you kind of work with automated captioning, the better it gets. So, you know, if students are using automated captioning, what are the implications for the development of listening skills in a second language? Is it even worth bothering teaching listening skills? Um, my own experience of teaching on pre-sessional courses is that often students' listening skills uh, are surprisingly low and students are you know, really struggle with decoding. That's just making sense of what they hear, let alone you know, making decisions what, about what are key points and what are not key points and, and, and note-taking. They struggle just to understand. So automated captioning for them is potentially really, really useful. Um, so I think there are two future scenarios. I mean, one is that students fail to improve their listening skills because there are fewer situations in which they have to decode. But the other is that, they, that automated captioning could help them improve their listening skills if they use it judiciously, if they use it to help improve word recognition. And if they don't go immediately to the automated captioning, if they listen without it and then listen again with it. So um, where does the EAP go from here? I think we need to research student use of online text processing tools. So there's been research into use of machine translation. I think we need to research how they're using those other tools. We, we need to understand those tools better. How can they help students and what can't they do for students? That's really important too. And then I think we need to train students and teachers how to use those tools. This is very difficult because the technology is developing all the time. There are new tools coming in. Which tools do we focus on? I think the language knowledge is still important, but do we need to teach forms for, for production? Um, um, do we need to assess um, accuracy in production? And I think some universities have, have already kind of responded to this. So some universities, for example, uh, on, on their PSE programs, they no longer assess accuracy, control of language, control of grammar and vocabulary in coursework, which students have been doing out of class, and they only assess it in exams where you can, you can, you can theoretically check that they're not using tools to help them. Um, do universities need to review academic integrity policies? Do we need more nuanced guidance? In the case of Reading, I can only really speak about uh, uh, Reading. Yes, definitely. We, because at Reading, there's, there's very little guidance for, for students on the use of, um, of, 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 of language checking tools or uh, machine translation. It's, it needs to be much more specific. And again, yeah, what are the, the, the implications for assessment? And then finally, what, what does um, a degree, what does a degree from a UK university now say about someone's um, proficiency in English? So it used to be the case that, um, it used to be the case that um, if you have a if you've got a degree from a UK university, that's evidence that you could communicate to a certain level in both spoken and written English, um, and th and that you could go on to do a professional job that requires communication in English. And I'm sure that this is an idea that this idea that um, 
a degree has a kind of intrinsic language value is something that the UKHE sector would like to preserve, but I don't know whether we can, I don't know for how much longer we can argue this case. And I think when it comes to employers, I think employers are voting with their feet. So most large automated translation projects are tailor-made for enterprises. So companies are already using um, machine trans translation, for example, um, multinational companies are already using it. They, they use it because it will save them money and time and it will achieve consistency. Um, so um, if they use uh, automated communication across different languages, then they don't necessarily need to employ traditionally bi or multilingual staff. So I think what they're looking for is for staff with skills in digital forms of international communication, not necessarily traditional forms of communication. And finally, I don't think we should be despondent. We want our uh, international students to do well and technology may help them com compete on a, on a more level playing field. So ultimately, university is about constructing truth and knowledge across a wide range of disciplines and for international students to be spending a lot of their time on, on their language skills that can impact that can impact on what they what they can achieve in their subject area so for EAP where we're constantly under threat of time I think technology will potentially free up time to focus on those aspects of teaching and learning for which a human teacher is still really needed so hopefully we won't have to spend hours and hours looking at students' drafts of writing assess ass assignments and trying to decide whether or not to flag up language errors. And students won't have to spend hours selecting different grammatical structures and lexis to use when they're drafting or on responding to feedback when they get it wrong. And I think that should be liberating for both students and teachers. That's the end of my presentation. I'm sorry I've talked for much longer than I had intended to, but I'm quite happy to stay on for um, 20, 30 minutes if, if necessary. Um, let me see, I'm just gonna get the chat up. Okay.